Welcome to The Read Along, a mini book club for your ears, a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. I'm your host, Scott. I'm your other host, Anita. And join us on a journey through a good book, one one chapter chapter at a time. time. Hosted and produced by Andrew Paul and Lisa Pruden, the Well Endowed Podcast explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds. The podcast tells the stories of how those endowments intersect with the community. You can check them out and subscribe right now at thewellendowedpodcast.com. Right up front, apologies for wheezing breaths and scratchy voices. We, uh, as a family, are coming off of a death cold. Yep. Oh, we were sick. Uh, inflicted upon us last week, and we've been suffering through the weekend, and we are still continuing to suffer through. <laughs> we're on the mend. Yes. Like, the worst of it is over. Seemingly. Yes. But, Some of um, us are better than others. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so voices are a little messed up today. Yes. Uh, Apologies for that. (laughs) We're doing our best. We are. But uh, as always, we don't want to miss an episode. Nope. But because we are feeling a little under the weather, we might make this one a little more perfunctory. (laughs) So uh, I guess we'll just dive right into a brief recap of our previous chapter, in which the team plunges into an eldritch maze, spends a great deal of time wandering around trying to figure out how to get out, and then bumps face first into a screaming spider. Ha <laughs> uh, ha! Which leads us into chapter nine of Questland by Carrie Vaughn. So I know I had suggested last chapter <laughs> there was the possibility that the spider was friendly. Yeah, nope. No. Nope. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't expecting it to be friendly. I just thought it might be... Maybe. It, may, it might be. Yeah. It, it was not. Yeah. And then, and then, there was another spider. And then, in fact, another spider And then on top another, of that. another spider. Yeah. So that's three spiders in total. I would have passed out. At this point, I would have passed out from fear. I would not have been okay. I would have passed out in a pile of my own poo because I would be so scared. Well, the good news is the mercenaries are not arachnophobes. and Thank uh, goodness. They quickly fall into formation, uh, basically two on either side of Addie, with her kind of hiding in between them <laughs> right? and open fire on the spiders. The bad news is the spiders are largely bulletproof because yeah. they are cyborgs. Uh, yeah, giant metal spiders, basically. So it goes pwang and ricochets off. And they're like, oh no, bullet ricochet. This is bad. Yeah. So they close in for hand to hand, which proves not only more effective, but super effective because the spiders have an off switch. Thank goodness. And once that's discovered, <laughs> they make very short work of them. Yeah, right? So they take down the one, because they found the off switch, Yeah, call it to the other two, who are like, oh, that's easy. Bang, bang, click. And then when the third one attacks, they're like, oh, we got this. Yeah, it's, it's not even a thing. It's yeah, just it's like, like oh, one-handed, yeah. like, wha-bam! There's another one. Spider down. And I was like, oh, thank God. Now, one notable thing that happens during this encounter, though, is Wendell does take a hit. Uh, he is slashed by a spider leg yeah. on his arm. It does draw <laughs> blood. And that, to Addie, definitely indicates that there is there is danger. Yeah. The monsters on this island are not pulling their punches. There's no there's no safety protocols. Yeah, the holodeck safety program is off. No. Moriarty is capable of inflicting lethal wounds, and the arch cannot be called for. Hold hold on. I don't know that that's necessarily the case because these spiders are programmed for adventurers, mm-hmm. right? clients. These mercenaries are coming at them with guns and knives. That's true. Right? So is it possible that Wendell was slashed with a hunk of metal that they created themselves and not necessarily a spider attack? That's possible. That's actually what I think happened. Is is that that it may have been an accident. Yeah. Well, and there's evidence to point in that direction later in the chapter, too. Without necessarily getting too far ahead of ourselves, they get a reaction from in-game NPCs yes. that is hostile based on the fact that they look scary. Yes. So it is entirely possible that, yeah, the spiders are programmed to deal with like fake swords and clubs 
and not actually being shot at and stabbed at by real weapons. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Genuinely, that's what I think happened, is that this spider is uh, now malfunctioning yeah, because it was, it's, it's an been accident. attacked, yeah. and that Wendell took a hit because of that. That's just my guess. Yeah, there's there's no way to confirm it at this point, but that is definitely a solid hypothesis. Yeah, but the point is that, yes, Wendell was hurt. Now, he kind of brushes off the injury at first <clears throat> because he's very excited to reach in and rip out some spider guts. Oh, yeah, he is super interested in this tech, and for good reason, because he thinks he can use it, and he can. Addy actually uh, likens this to a very thorough party member picking through corpses after a combat <laughs> encounter in any game tabletop or video she's not wrong because you know when you're in a video game and you fight a bunch of wolves they drop pieces of sandwich and <laughs> gold and pre full, pelts full suits of armor <laughs> and so i mean yeah. you, you check that stuff out right of course now these spiders don't drop any gold or anything but they do as you mentioned have valuable tech inside and wendell's hypothesis here is something must be a allowing them to navigate the maze and yep. b keeping them in the maze yes. so they must have some sort of transponder or something Makes sense. And sure enough, he reaches in and rips out a piece of spider brain that is a little black box and hooks it up to his laptop. And now he's got the piece of string that they've been wanting this whole time. Yeah, basically. Yeah. He's got a little red flashing light now that beeps in the direction that they should go. Yeah. Great. And he very ably leads them out of the maze at this juncture. It still takes a little bit of time, but they don't hit any more dead ends. They're making their way out. Yeah. And Addie is at once relieved because she's no longer the one leading them and therefore feels like the, the burden of pressure is off her. But at the same time, it's like, well, now I feel even more useless. And this especially coming off the fact that she just spent the entire combat encounter not doing anything. Well, not a trained combatant. No. So I don't think she should feel bad about that. But she does. I know she does. Because she's, she's really in this chapter feeling like the load for this group. I know. She shouldn't, but she does. They make their way towards the end. Torres actually takes a moment to quickly and thoroughly check for traps on their way out, which, again, Addy is mentally congratulating him, being yeah. like, he's starting to think like the party leader. Someone has learned, check for traps. None are found, and they finally emerge out of the Eldritch Maze into the sunlight. Yes. And take a, a moment to, like, take a deep breath. Addy turns off the torch. It's got a button. <laughs> like, that literally a button. you can see now? Yeah. yeah. But here's the problem. Now they're lost. Yeah, well, there's a couple problems. In the light of the waning day, they can definitely see that Wendell is actually pretty badly cut on his shoulder. And even he's like, oh, yeah, maybe maybe you should take a look at that, Almonte. <laughs> well, uh, and she said at the beginning, like, he needs stitches. Yeah. Um, and he was just like, nah, it's fine. But now he's like, oh, no, that actually oh. does, <laughs> I see, I does see look pretty bad. I see you bleeding a lot here. Yeah. Uh, we should do something about this. So Torres is like, all right, well, let's take 10. I'll see if I can figure out where we are. Because they've emerged from the side of a hill question mark yeah they're topside again but they don't know where they are yeah so let, let me get a bit of the lay of the land we'll all take a quick break almonte you patch up wendell everyone have a drink let's move to some higher ground in 10 minutes and then we'll see if we can orient ourselves so they have a quick breather get back up and start heading upwards yeah because the the theory is if they can get to some high ground they can figure out where they are on the island no I, which is strategically yeah. very smart like High ground gives you good vantage. You can see, try to see where you are yeah. and figure out where you're supposed to go. Absolutely. Uh, the problem is when you're in a hex crawl, when you move into the next hex, you have a DM who's going to roll for another random encounter. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, the GM rolls that they encounter a little woodlands <laughs> village. They enter Critter Country. <laughs> Critter Country. Mr. Toad's wild ride is over yonder. <laughs> Splash Mountain is all set up. And a... Uh, <laughs> Don't make me laugh, I choke. <clears throat> and a, a village of, of tiny little critters lies in their way. And everybody immediately stops because, again, possible danger. But both Almonte and Addie are just like, aww. When she, she, Almonte's so funny because she's like, oh, that's adorable. Yeah. It's <clears throat> like, literally, it's anthropomorphic woodland critters just kind of having a life. I believe she calls it uh, the world of Richard Scary. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> There's like bunnies and foxes and mice all oh, yeah. just kind of cohabitating. In, in sun hats and like gingham dresses carrying baskets of flowers. Yeah. Like, yeah, super cute. Now Torres, as per usual, is like, all right, well, we don't want to interrupt this little idyllic hamlet. So we're just going to back off, skirt around. around and find somewhere else to advance. And Addie is <sighs> like, nah, we're not going to do that. Addie, Addie, Addie. 
Clearly, this village is a haven. These are friendly forest creatures who will be able to perhaps point us where we need to go. I'm going to go and parlay with them. Daddy, no. And just like waltzes out into the clearing against Torres's better warnings again. Yep. And like walks up to the nearest farmer rabbit and is like, hey ho, friendly critter. Could you point us in the way of Tor Camelot? And the rabbit chitters back to her in woodland language. I imagine it's the kind of uh, sound you hear in Animal Crossing. Yeah, basically. <laughs> That's like, kind of what it, I, I assumed it sounded like. It's just animal nonsense. And she's like, okay, I can now see the flaw in my plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's where it goes bad. The rest of the party comes up behind her. Well, yeah, because she's wandered off into the clearing alone. And Torres rightly is probably like, sigh, we better go back her up. <sighs> right. Except they show up with, you know, guns. Yeah, they're armed mercenaries. Right. So the animals are like, ah, danger. <laughs> Well, yeah, the rabbit, like, immediately gets wary and, like, retreats back towards the town square. And uh, all the other critters start noticing this group of humans who are standing there looking menacing and start to, like, huddle up. They kind of talk amongst themselves. And then, like, one mouse in particular steps up as kind of like a leader. He's better dressed than the other ones. He's got a bit of swagger. and He's, he's... like the town champion, yeah. right? And, I mean, Addie was kind of hoping she'd see a foxy Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> because we're all hoping for Foxy Robin Hood. Come I mean, on now. everybody's seen the Disney Robin Hood and everybody is hoping to see a Foxy Robin Hood. But uh, instead, it's this like mouse champion. And he basically like holds up his hands to the rest of the town and is like, guys, it's cool. I got this. <laughs> I got this. And he pulls out his little sword <laughs> and he like swaggers over to the group and like issues a challenge and pokes Rucker in the boot. Doesn't even like stab him properly because it doesn't Penit pierce his no, boot. In no, any exactly. Way. It just sort of. Hits the leather of his boot. And Rucker reacts by kicking the mouse, who oh. soars over the entire village and, like, dies in a field far away. Now, it hurt. in Rucker's defense, that mouse made a clearly hostile gesture towards him. Yes, but. It, it struck first. Yes, but. But Rucker way overreacts. Way overreacts. The town takes the death of their champion poorly. Um... <laughs> Like some of the some of the mice start grieving, the children start getting ushered into houses, people start emerging with like spears and helmets, they start wheeling out a tiny trebuchet full of rocks. Oh yeah, like torches and pitchforks oh, yeah. com coming out from this little village. Like here. they have they have just made enemies. And Torres and Addie are both kind of like, We should go now. Yes. Actually I think everybody except Rucker. Yeah, is Rucker like, we should go. Rucker is angry and is like, I can take this and like cocks his gun. And this is the point where Addie's like, Nope. Well, okay. Two things. One, Rucker is clearly overreacting here. This is a trigger happy dude who is pent up and needs some sort of overly testosterone release. And two this triggers Addie's PTSD. Yeah. And these two things are a bad combo. Because she sees the little forest creatures as largely innocent. I mean, they are the ones who wandered in and looked yeah, exactly. menacing and then, like, beat up their champion. These these little animals were just living their little... Animal life. Little robot programmed animal lives. Yeah, they're just having their little root village life here. Yeah. And Rucker showed up and, like, killed a guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when he threatens to just take out the whole town, she throws herself in the way and is like, no, you're not going to hurt these Oh, guys. no, like screaming and crying, like, no, like throws herself in front of his gun. The animals don't stop approaching. Like, they don't take this as, oh, well, she's clearly on our side. Yeah, no. So El Monte grabs Addie and Torres grabs Rucker <laughs> and they get dragged bodily back. Like, they run. They, they run from an angry mob of animals yes. for a while. <laughs> Well, enough to be totally out of yeah. like range. The good news right? is, I mean, they're these are giants compared to these animals. They can traverse a lot of terrain very quickly because they have longer legs. Yeah, exactly. And they, yeah, they they escape. Addie takes a moment to collapse and have a panic, oh, a full blown panic attack. Addie is not okay at this um, point. Not okay. Rucker's like, "What's her problem?" and gets told she's got PTSD. Guy, genuinely surprised that Torres didn't just slap him across the face. Well, last night we had a couple passing words about this chapter and you had mentioned that you were surprised Rucker wasn't informed of this ahead of time. Yeah. Because the implication. You'd think the, implication, the team would know yeah. that she, like, look, we're bringing her with us. Here's some things you need to know about her. This is why, like, she was doing the desensitizing training with them yeah. on the firing range. Either Rucker forgot 
doesn't know how PTSD works or he's just that much of an a-hole. It's possible he was not fully briefed because it's none of his business and he's just trusted to be professional enough not to shoot unless he's told to. Mm. But He was not told to shoot. Or... For the record. Yeah, he was not. In fact, he was specifically told to stand down and, and run. Yes. On the other hand, it's also possible he just doesn't really recognize how bad PTSD is. Yeah, fair enough. It's possible he's never encountered it in a person before. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, Still, like, dude, pull yourself together. Have a little humanity. Eddie gets a couple minutes to compose herself. And at that point, Torres is like, you know what? We're going to find a safe spot. We're going to camp for the night. And the team is like, I mean, we could press on through the night. And he's like, nope, we're taking a break. Nope. Addie is done. We need to take a break. And Addie feels particularly miserable at this because yeah. she's like, I am slowing them down. And this is compounding basically her entire attitude this chapter, which is that since the encounter with the spiders, she's felt useless. Yep. She was no longer the person solving the maze, so she was just kind of following at that point. And this is another thing we had discussed last night. Most of her, like, impulsive jumping into the quests up to this point have really felt like her curiosity getting the best Yeah, she wants to play the game. She she wants to engage. She's curious about what's going on. This time felt a little different. Right? It felt like she wasn't just trying to play the game. She was trying to prove that she was useful. Yeah. Right? She wanted to make up for the fact that she had screwed up and gotten them into a maze. And then was unable to get them out of the maze. Right? And was unable to help them fight the spiders in the maze. <clears throat> she wanted to be useful. Yeah. She wanted to prove that she w- could be helpful. And that kind of did And then that work. backfired on her as well. And I genuinely felt for her in this chapter. Because it's not PTSD. Like, it's not nearly as extreme. But one of my major triggers is, like, innocent people getting hurt. I cannot handle it in movies when they hurt kids. Scott has had to pause movies for me several times. He's like, do you need to Do you need to have a cry? And I'm like, yes, I do. Well, I mean, longtime listeners to the podcast will know <laughs> that famously we read books where nothing but terrible things happen to children. And <laughs> most of the time, Nita's the one who chose those books and then feels terrible for having done so. Well, not knowing that children are going to be hurt. Like, I'm not okay with it. So the fact that... Addie threw herself in front of a real gun to protect fake animals. Well, they're not fake. They're not real animals. I mean, they're they're clearly living their own little animal lives. Yeah, I know. But they're little robots. We know that. The point is, I really felt for Addie in this because I totally related to that. Don't hurt them. They didn't do anything wrong. I mean, that one mouse did posture and pick (laughs) pick a fight with the wrong guy. Yeah. He was defending his home. He was defending his home, yes. Just saying. I was actually thinking, like, it's it's a shame they couldn't speak the same language. It's a, it, we don't know that the critters couldn't understand English, but they definitely couldn't speak English. Mm-hmm. Because the rabbit did stop and listen to Addie, but there's no real indication that it necessarily understood her. It could have literally been saying to her, like, I have no idea what you're talking about, lady. <laughs> don't understand you. What's up? My mind went back to that ring that they found before they fell into the trap. And got dumped in the maze because they still haven't figured out what it does. And I half wondered, like, if somebody had had that ring on, is it a ring of languages that allows you to understand and parlay with the critters on the island? Hard to say. Okay. I realize that this island is made up of somewhat futuristic technology to what we have now. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a step too far. We haven't mastered universal translators. You don't need a universal translator when you've programmed the language the critters are speaking. Yes, but you're talking about like a biomechanical interface with any human being. Nonsense. We're talking about a ring that maybe can translate for you. How? Just have the creature speak and then the ring just emits a little translation, like audibly. I'm not saying that it's in your head that you can understand them. I'm just saying the ring could have been a translator. I don't know that that's the case. I'm just hypothesizing. I am I still think that's a bit much. And I'm, I, I'm not talking about sticking a babel fish in your ear here. <laughs> Good. I'm just, I'm just saying that there must be some way to understand the creatures on the island. Agreed. And, I and don't necessarily was, know that it's the ring. A, a thought was maybe it could be the ring. That feels, again, it feels a little weird and a bit much. And a weird clash of, I don't know what to call them. A weird clash of like story cannons? Mythos, maybe? I mean... You find a gold ring in an eldritch shrine 
that lets you talk to adorable woodland creatures? I'm going to remind you that we're on an island that has a sphinx guarding a tower and an eldritch maze full of spiders and a little Mr. Toad's Wild Ride Critter Country. Okay, fair enough. You got me there. There's a whole bunch of <laughs> of like royalty free fantasy just being thrown at this island right now. This, but does like this not fact, feel like cra- like clashing mythos to you though? Like the fact that there was a town of anthropomorphic woodlands creatures really did make me go, huh. Though to be fair, um, while this did kind of jump out at me as like, oh, that's interesting and doesn't seem to line up with the fantasy that we've been seeing so far. On the other hand, it made me go, but wouldn't you want a place for kids to go? That's what thought I had too. That this is like for younger kids. This is a little kid section of the island. Yeah, this is a little kid fantasy area as opposed to the grown up fantasy area where you've got like warg riders and giant spiders. You've got a little place for the kids to go and have a little adventure with all the little woodlands creatures. Yes, I thought a, that too. Have a little Robin Hood. I thought that too. And yeah. I thought, what a cool thing. Uh, except that, you know, Rucker was going to shoot it. But yeah. This chapter absolutely gave me feels. Well, there you go. That's good. A book should give you feels. This this particular chapter gave me feels. And I'm really curious about what is coming in the next chapter. Whether it's going to be like their evening around a campfire, right? Making camp. Or if we're just going to pick up, we're just going to leave this here, this whole episode, and pick up the next day and carry on. If I were to wager a guess, we'd have an, a chapter with an evening around the campfire. Partly because... A good classic Dungeons and Dragons adventure, you have a, a nighttime encounter. You need to have a story beat. You have someone, <laughs> someone needs to keep watch, and at some point, something shows up in the night and wakes up the party, right? So my guess is we're going to have a nighttime encounter. Oh, yeah. But could be wrong. I know, we'll I'm see. happy to be surprised. We, as always, haven't read ahead, but we will now read chapter 10 of Questland, which you'll want to do in time for next week. In the meantime, you know, Wendell suffered a pretty serious injury from a spider during this chapter, and as a contract worker, probably doesn't have an entitlement to full benefits, certainly from uh, from Mr. Harris Lang, but hopefully Torres has some sort of benefits in place for his team. <laughs> and as a small business owner, he might have turned to a company like Alberta Blue Cross to arrange for those benefits in case of workplace injury. <laughs> Is your job accidentally going to expose you to giant spiders? Do you need coverage? This episode of The Read Along is brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Life as a business owner can be hectic, to say the least. Alberta Blue Cross understands that. They offer flexible health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Even better, you can let your staff enroll and manage their coverage at any time and on any device. That makes life easier for them and for you. You've got this when it comes to group coverage for your small business. And Alberta Blue Cross has got your back. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. Alberta Blue Cross. Protecting you from giant spiders since 1957. You made up that number. Absolutely. I made up most of that. (laughs) At any rate, uh, something that we are not making up is that you can find information about Alberta Blue Cross and all of the other podcast sponsors right now at albertapodcastnetwork.com. Yes. While you're there, you can also check out all the other member podcasts, tons of podcasts, lots of different subjects, not all of them, much like our own, necessarily about Alberta, so you can definitely find something good there. Absolutely. Download them on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, While you're there, that's probably also where you're catching our pod. You can give us a little rating and review. Oh, we would appreciate that. We like feedback. You can also reach out to us on social media. Absolutely. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Goodreads, because we bookish like that. And yeah, we're at the read along at all of the above. Mm. For more or less. More or less. Uh, you can also send us an email. Yes, we are the read along at gmail.com. And with that said, as always, we love you very much. Stay healthy. Yes. See you next time. Drink water. Thank you for joining us on The Read Along with your hosts, Anita and Scott Bourgeois, a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network. All Read Along music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Cover art is by Aaron Beaver. Be sure to join us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Read Along, and check out our group on Goodreads.com.